Good morning and welcome to the 2021 Virtual African Bird Fair. Thanks for joining us on Feeder 2 and a big thank you to our gold sponsors, Rico, Canon, Toyota South Africa, Boundless Southern Africa and Swarovski Optic for making this exciting event possible. Coming up next will be an overview of the important conservation work being carried out by BirdLife South Africa. One of the projects you will hear about is the White Wing Flufftail Project and there is currently a beautiful painting depicting this elusive species conservation journey up for grabs in the silent auction. Why not head over there to place your bid after this lecture? I will now hand over to the talented and hardworking BirdLife South Africa team to share the diverse and important work they are undertaking to protect the birds of Southern Africa. Hi everyone and a warm welcome at the Virtual African Bird Fair on behalf of BirdLife South Africa's conservation staff during this presentation, I will present an overview of the work undertaken by our conservation division. BirdLife South Africa strives to conserve birds, both land birds and seabirds, and their habitats. Our habitat protection work is mostly focused on the declaration of protected environments within strategic water source areas, focusing on the protection of the entire ecosystem and the ecosystem services they're in, as well as the restoration of important habitats. We also believe that our conservation work needs to be inclusive of people, and hence there should be direct and indirect benefits to local communities. We also believe in the strength of partnerships, and just to highlight one is that we value our relationship with the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. We have six conservation programs, seabird conservation, landscape conservation, empowering people, regional conservation, science and innovation and policy and advocacy. We'll start our overview with the regional conservation program. This program focuses on providing guidance and support to countries and bird life partners throughout Africa, so beyond the borders of South Africa. And here we assess the threat status of taxa using the IUCN Red List criteria. We also help to identify important habitats that should be protected. As such, we are involved in spatial prioritization mainly through the delineation of key biodiversity areas. We also focus on species conservation, mostly on migratory birds along the East Atlantic Flyway. We provide further policy and advocacy support throughout the African region. And that brings us to our second program, the Policy and Advocacy Program, with the first objective to address national and regional casework in a prioritized and efficient manner. The second objective of this program is to provide support and improved implementation of nat national and international conservation frameworks and multilateral environmental agreements. So just to highlight one example here is our support to the Department of Environment in terms of the implementation of single species and multi-species action plans under the African Eurasian Migratory Water Bird Agreement. Our third objective here is to ensure that the conservation objectives are integrated into relevant global law and policy. This program also uh, publishes important guidelines and just to highlight one of those recent publications, which is a species environmental assessment guideline, which defines the minimum reporting criteria for the environmental impact assessment process. We're so proud ourselves in that all our work is based on science. And over the past two years, we as a, cons as a conservation team have published more than 10 peer reviewed scientific publications. And these publications help to guide effective conservation action. Our third program, the Science and Innovation Program, brings important scientific uh, support to all our other conservation programs. And just to highlight some aspects of work, um, they're responsible for uh, the habitat suitability models that's done for threatened and endemic species. And these models ensure that focal bird habitats are taken into account by spatial planners and included in the National Protected Area Expansion Strategy. 
This program for the next two or three years will be very busy with the revision of the regional red list of birds of South Africa, Lesotho and Swaziland. So in our 2015 red list, we've seen that of the region's birds, 132 is listed as threatened or near threatened, and 45 of those are seabirds, emphasizing the importance of our fourth program, the Seabird Conservation Program, with a focus on minimizing the threats to our seabirds. And there's a specific focus on three of those threat areas, the first being the eradication of invasive alien species, the second of the reduction of bycatch to our pelagic seabirds, and the third being specifically focused on overfishing, so resource competition between our coastal seabirds and fisheries. And we term that an ecosystem approach to fisheries. So there's two work streams within the seabird conservation projects. Um, within coastal seabirds, we also focus on the establishment of new colonies for African penguins, the endangered um, African penguin. So basically, we're taking penguins to where there's good food resources. And then within the pelagic seabirds, we focus on reducing the threat of bycatch uh, brought by longline and trawl fisheries, specifically to our albatrosses and petrels. And finally, a project that's really gaining momentum is the eradication of mice from Marion Island. This brings us to our second last program, also the largest program um, within the conservation division, the landscape conservation program, with two work streams within protecting ecosystems and protecting species. Our species work is focused on vulture conservation and the establishment of vulture safe zones, as well as raptor and large racial bird conservation, as well as the conservation of blue swallows and white-winged flufftails. So the white-winged flufftail is used as a flagship species for wetland conservation. Within this program, there's also a focus on birds and renewable energy. And here we minimize the threats to our bird species specifically brought through the development of wind and solar energy facilities. Our protecting ecosystems work is focused on the declaration of protected environments and we've secured more than 100,000 hectares over the past 10 years that's been added to the conservation estate in South Africa. And this work specifically focused on conservation of high altitude grasslands and then also mist belt grassland and also estuaries in the Western Cape. Our last program is the Empowering People program and we've trained more than 200 community bird guides with more 50 than of those making a permanent living as professional guides. We also believe in not only training these guides, but providing support and upskilling um, our, our community bird guides. This program is also growing, so we're very fortunate to announce that we'll start a community conservation project in the north of Kozula Natal in Zululand. And that will be focused by a second project uh, dependent on uh, funds being raised in southern KwaZulu Natal at Nsikeni Nature Reserve. This project will focus on upskilling of existing bird guides, training of environmental monitors, education of youth and adults, um, building on the fantastic environmental education work undertaken in the Wackerstrom area by our staff as well as a focus on awareness and habitat rehabilitation. So with this, I will end my presentation. I'd just like to thank um, you for your attention, as well as all our donors contributing to our important conservation work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Virtual African Bird Fair. My name is Alistair McInnes, and I'll be telling you about the work that we do for the Seabird Conservation Program at BirdLife South Africa. The high abundance and diversity of seabirds in South Africa make this a vital destination for any seabird enthusiast. Our waters are host to about 59 pelagic species that forage offshore and 25 coastal species that breed and forage close to shore. Sadly, 15 pelagic and five coastal species are currently classified as globally threatened. The Seabird Conservation Program is made up of dedicated and passionate conservationists 
whose key objective is to ameliorate threats to threatened seabirds in South Africa. Seabirds play a crucial role in marine ecosystems as top predators that influence prey dynamics and nutrient transfer. They are also good indicators of marine ecosystem health, so-called sentinels of the sea. For pelagic species globally, the greatest at-sea threat to long-lived species, species such as albatrosses is associated with interactions with fishing gear, known as bycatch. Our Albatross Task Force focuses its efforts on minimizing this threat to seabirds across several different fishing fleets. The ATF team includes Andrea Angel as team leader and Riza Ninyungera as a project manager. Our island restoration project is focused on another major threat to seabirds, invasive mammalian predators on islands. The focus of this work is centered around the eradication of house mice on Marion Island. Dr. Anton Wolfart heads up this project as the Mouse Free Marion project manager. The coastal seabird team is mostly focused on three endangered Benguela endemic seabirds, African penguin, Cape Gannet, and Cape Cormorant, although most of the work to date has been focused on African penguins. This work primarily involves securing at-sea habitat for these specialist hunters that forage on sardine and anchovy, which are also targeted by the fishing industry. We're also creating new colonies where fish are abundant and there's little competition for this resource. This team includes Christina Hagen, Tegan carpenter Kling and me. The Albatross Task Force team in South Africa is one of five teams globally working on preventing seabird bycatch. Albatrosses, petrels and shearwaters are most affected as they spend most of their lives at sea in search of food, which they can find by scavenging behind fishing vessels. Reducing seabird bycatch requires a multi-pronged approach involving engagement on four main levels. The ATF conducts trips on fishing vessels to carry out at-sea seabird monitoring and research into the effectiveness and development of mitigation measures with the help of the crew, which also helps raise awareness amongst fishers. The ATF's onshore engagement with crew and fishers through harbour visits is key to further research and information gathering. The ATF also runs workshops and training courses for fishers and other partners such as fishery observer agencies. The ATF works with NGOs and organizations offering market incentives for sustainable fishing, such as the Marine Stewardship Council and WWF. A flagship pro project involves working with a group of pe people with disabilities from a poor community. And finally, in conjunction with other partners, the ATF engages with government and researchers to advocate for improved legislation and compliance measures. South Africa has five legislated seabird bycatch mitigation measures as part of fisheries permit conditions. The bird scaring line required by all trawl and longline fleets works by keeping birds away from potentially colliding with trawl cables or accessing baited hooks before they sink out of reach of diving birds. Managing offal discards as part of the onboard practices aimed at eliminating or reducing offal discarding or disposing of it away from fishing gear, thus minimizing interactions with birds seeking food. Night setting on longline vessels reduces interactions with most pelagic seabirds, which prim primarily forage during the day. Exceptions are full moon days and a few species that also feed at night. Adding weight to baited hooks reduce reduces the time that the bait remains close to the surface and within reach of foraging birds. The hook pod is, is an all-in-one solution for fleets using hooks. It shields the baited hook from where when it is set and until it has sunk to a predetermined depth. Then a pressure sensor mechanism opens the pod, releasing the baited hook well out of reach of diving birds. No fleet is yet using this device in South Africa, primarily, primarily due to the expense. An important objective of the ATF is to ensure the provisioning of effective seabird bycatch mitigation measures to the fishing industry. Since 2011, they have worked with the Ocean View Association for Persons with Disabilities in a project that manufactures and provides bird scaring lines to the fishing industry. The project makes a significant difference to otherwise marginalized people, enabling, enabling them help support their families. They are the unsung heroes that behind the scenes contribute to saving our seabirds. A grant from the Marine Stewardship Council is allowing the ATF to work with small hake inshore fishing vessels that struggle to implement standard mitigation measures. By working directly with the crew in developing attachment structures for bird scaring lines, the ATF will re reduce the current risk these vessels pose to seabirds. Ensuring compliance with mitigation measures is an ongoing challenge. 
With the help of a grant from the Agreement on the Conservation of Albatrosses and Petrels, the ATF is helping develop a bird scaring line compliance device able to automatically record when the bird scaring lines are used during fishing operations without the need for an onboard observer. These graphs show the scale of the success that the ATF program has achieved since its inception in 2006, a reduction in 99% in the number of albatrosses killed by trawl cable collisions each year, from approximately 7,300 to less than 100 birds um, today. Similarly, in the joint venture along line fleet, close to 3,000 seabirds were drowning annually after swallowing baited hooks. By ensuring compliance with mitigation measures, these needless deaths have been reduced by 85%. The ATF is the only program engaged in reducing seabird bycatch in South Africa today, and there's still much work to be done. Oceanic islands are critical breeding habitat for most pelagic seabirds, and the waters surrounding these islands provide important foraging habitat to many seabird species. Currently, the largest threat to seabirds is invasive alien predators on many of these islands. Although oceanic islands only make up about 5% of the world's landmass, they house 19% of avian biodiversity. 75% of all bird, amphibian, mammal, and reptile extinctions have happened on islands, and 80% 86% of these extinctions are linked to invasive species. It's therefore vital to remove invasive species from these highly sensitive and critical habitats. Invasive species such as mice and rats were introduced to these islands unintentionally, often as stowaways and whaling and sealing boats hundreds of years ago. As intentional trade and sea transport increased, the stowaways were transported to more remote locations. The majority of these islands have no natural predators to keep the invasive rodent populations under control. Invasive rodents have profound impacts on the ecology of these islands, changing plant and invertebrate communities and having devastating impacts on seabird populations. The preferred method to restore these islands to safe breeding sites is through invasive species eradication. Research on Gough Island has shown that over time the mice there have become up to 50% larger than the average house mice. These mice prey on eggs, chicks, and even adult seabirds attending their nests. The seabirds that breed on these islands have not evolved any defense mechanisms against this predation and have to endure the horror of being eaten alive over a number of days. To achieve mice or rodent eradication, grain-based pellets with trace amounts of bridificum, a rodent poison, are dispersed over the island by helicopters, a challenging operation that requires highly skilled expertise. To emphasize the challenging nature of these operations, Keith Broom, a well-known expert on the matter, sums it up. Eradication is not control intensified. It must remove the last individual. And the level of resourcing is whatever it takes. To underachieve eradication means failure. The approach must be to overachieve it. The eradication of house mice on Marion Island is planned for 2023. This will be the largest mouse eradication operation undertaken on an island given the large surface area of Marion and the widespread infestation of, the, of these rodents, which are having serious impacts on albatrosses and especially burying petrels. Mousery Marion is a collaborative project between BirdLife South Africa and the, the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, and is managed under a separate nonprofit company set up specifically for this project. So moving to coastal seabirds, we have several species of coastal seabirds endemic to the Benguela current system. Three of the five threatened species are all fish specialists relying on healthy supplies of anchovy and sardine in the, in the Benguela ecosystem. The coastal seabird team works closely with the government and fishing industry to advocate for an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. This is a more holistic approach to fisheries man management that incorporates ecosystem and socioeconomic concerns into the fisheries management framework rather than the conventional approach that is centered around a single target species. The coastal seabird team is also working on different approaches to integrate ecosystem concerns into the way the catch limits are set for sardine and anchovy. Unfortunately, the population of Africa's only penguin species has decreased dramatically recently. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were an estimated 1.4 to 3 million individuals across 32 breeding colonies from Namibia to Algoa Bay in South Africa. In 2019, however, approximately only 35,000 individuals were found to be breeding in the wild. Over the past few decades, these declines are thought to have been driven by shifts in the distribution and reduced availability of their main prey, anchovy and sardine, as well as competition with fisheries. 
The African penguin island closure experiment is a good example of an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. We have been working closely with other NGOs, seabird scientists and government to assess the impact of per and fishing closures around four of the largest African penguin breeding colonies for the past 12 years. Results of this experiment will be used by government fisheries management to make a decision about limiting resource competition in sensitive penguin habitat. Breeding penguins stay relatively close to their colonies, returning almost daily to feed and care for their chicks. When they are no longer responsible for feeding chicks, they can range far from their colonies, often into areas that have no formal protection. A collaboration between BirdLife South Africa and various academic institutions and other scientists are investigating the distribution of non-breeding penguins from major colonies such as Dassin Island, Stony Point and Bird Island to identify important foraging areas during two critical life history stages. Information coming from this study will inform spatial management of these important ecosystems. Another way that we are helping to address the threat of lower food availability for African penguins is by attempting to establish new breeding colonies in areas of high fish abundance. Working with Cape Nature and other penguin experts, we identified the Duhurp Nature Reserve on the southern coast, 300 kilometers east of Cape Town, as a suitable place to start. Penguins actually tried to breed there previously, but ultimately abandoned the colony because of predation. In 2018, we constructed a pred predator proof fence to ensure that leopards and other predators cannot access this area. Shortly after this, we installed lifelike penguin decoys and speakers playing penguin calls to make it look and sound like there was already a colony there. The next step is to release young African penguins at the colony. In partnership with Sankob, we took the step in June 2021 and have so far released 58 African penguins at Duluth. The penguins were abandoned as eggs or chicks and were hand reared at Sankob. None of our work would be possible without the generous support of our sponsors and the collaborations we have with our partners. A huge thanks to you guys for supporting the Seabird Program's important conservation work. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Melissa Whitecross, Manager of the Landscape Conservation Program at BirdLife South Africa. We aim to incorporate people, species and the environment into all of our scientifically based projects to ensure that these important ecological services are enjoyed and preserved for many generations to come to the benefit of our birds and biodiversity. The program is made up of two work streams, with the Protecting Ecosystems work stream focusing on securing important sites for birds and biodiversity through relevant mechanisms such as biodiversity stewardship. The Protecting Species work stream aims to deliver focused conservation projects that mitigate threats against our most threatened birds. We have a hardworking team of eight conservation officers and one intern, with targeted focal landscapes in the high altitude grasslands and wetlands, the Western Cape estuaries and northern KwaZulu-Natal. BirdLife South Africa has supported the declaration of over 145,000 hectares of grasslands and estuaries across South Africa, with a further 45,000 hectares in progress. We've just launched an exciting project in the Western Cape, recognizing, assessing and reporting on other effective area-based conservation measures, also known as OECMs. These are properties where conservation of biodiversity is a secondary benefit to the primary land use objective. BirdLife South Africa is also actively declaring vulture safe zones across the region that aim to mitigate threats within a broader landscape to support our most threatened group of birds, our vultures. The Protecting Ecosystems team will now share some of the insights into their respective projects with all of you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Karina Pinor, Ingula Project Manager for BirdLife South Africa. Biodiversity stewardship is a way for private landowners to become custodians of their land, using it wisely so that the natural environment is protected. 
Private landowners have a very important role to play to conserve biodiversity in South Africa, as it cannot be protected through our national park system alone. Biodiversity stewardship is categorized into four levels in South Africa, starting at the top level with the nature reserve, with a high landowner commitment and high protection status, and just below that, a protected environment, which has a little less landowner commitment but also a little less protection status, allowing the landowners to continue with their day-to-day -day activities, including ag agricultural activities. Below that, biodiversity management agreements and conservation areas are not worked with BirdLife South Africa that often because of their very low protection statuses. So why are grasslands important? First and foremost, it's very important in mitigating some of the biggest challenges that we face in South Africa and globally, including climate change. And grasslands can help through carbon sequestration and water production to mitigate the climate change uh, issues. It is also a very important source to secure our food resources. Another um, benefit is that it's also the home to a lot of threatened species in South Africa. Being one of the least protected ecosystems in South Africa, it also uh, means that the, the inhabitants of this ecosystem is also threatened. This include Orobi, our cranes, all three of them, secretary birds, bustards and corans, southern bald ibis, rudd's lark, Boerter's lark and yellow-breasted pipit, which are all three endemic to the high altitude grasslands in South Africa, meaning that they occur only in the high altitude grasslands of South Africa, and also the white-winged flufftail, which is criti critically endangered and only occur in the high altitude wetlands. Because of this, the grasslands in South Africa, and specifically the high altitude Mesic Highfelt grassland fire region, is a priority area for BirdLife South Africa. We've been working in the grasslands for 20 years, and it all started with the Ingula Pump Storage Scheme, now called the Ingula Nature Reserve, since it's been declared in 2018. And most recently, it was designated as South Africa's 27th wetland of international importance, according to the Ramsar Convention. The Ingula Nature Reserve and Pump Storage Scheme is done in collaboration with ESKIM and the Middleton Wetland Trust through the Angula Partnership. Around the Angula Nature Reserve, we are also establishing the Upper Vilge Protected Environment. To the north of that, we are working around Miamal with the already declared Snewberg Protected Environment. And we have recently started working around Freda as well with the de declaration of a new nature reserve called the Jethalo Nature Reserve, all aimed to protect these grasslands for the future of our threatened species. Thank you very much. My name is Carl Lloyd and I am the Rock Jumper Fellow of White Wing Flufftail Conservation. I'll be telling you a little bit more about wetland stewardship in the grassland biome. We can define inland wetlands as the transitional zone between terrestrial and aquatic systems where the water table is at or near the surface, with vegetation communities adapted to saturated soil conditions. Inland wetlands, along with estuaries, are classified as the most unprotected and threatened ecosystem type in South Africa. But why should we conserve wetlands? What value do they add to society? While well, wetlands provide a host of ecosystem services to both local and international communities by providing regulating and supporting services, provisioning services, and cultural services. The most important of these is the regulation of water entering a wetland through the catchment. This water is purified and supplied at a steady rate to downstream users. One protected environment which BirdLife South Africa interacts with regularly is the Greater Lark and Flay Protected Environment, or GLPE. The GLPE is located between Belfast and Dalstrom in Mpumalanga province, and it was proclaimed due to the increasing threat of mining. It protects vital river sources and an extensive wetland system. It was established in 2017 and protects 14,000 hectares of farmland. The GLPE is administered by a Landowners Association Committee, which has seen several successes 
and as future objectives for the PE. But how do we as BirdLife South Africa assist the GLP? Well, firstly, our environmental lawyers at, through the policy and advocacy program address inappropriate developments within and outside the GLPE. We've also assisted now recently with the expansion of the GLPE. And as you can see from this map, so this green area is what has already been established and the blue areas are landowners who wish to join the protected environment. We can also provide landowners with best practice guidelines for wetland management through the research that is conducted through the White Wing Flufftail Project. We are also trying to establish aviatourism in the area to develop an appreciation of birds with the public and as a source of revenue for landowners. This project does, however, require funding. So please contact me if you would like to support. Thank you. If you want more information about our grasslands, please watch, watch our Conservation Conversations webinar on YouTube. Just go look for Biodiversity Stewardship in the Grasslands or visit www.birdlife.org.za. If you have specific questions, please email us at our email addresses at the bottom of this page. Thank you very much. Greetings, everybody. I'm going to be talking to you about the BirdLife South Africa Conservation Outcomes Partnership and what we have been doing to conserve blue swallow habitat and to monitor their populations. Um, the project objective is to continue and improve conservation of blue swallows and their threatened grassland habitat in KwaZulu-Natal and in Pumalanga in South Africa. So for those of you who don't know a little bit about what the blue swallow is, they are a very distinctive iridescent metallic blue swallow. They are a beautiful little bird with long tail streamers and um, they really are special. They're an intra-African migrant and they spend summers in South Africa and winters in East Africa. They favor high altitude grasslands, it's right up to about just under 2000 meters from about 850 meters and with high rainfall, so greater than about 1000 millimeters per annum in South Africa. They are cooperative breeders. They do help each other to raise chicks and they nest in sinkholes, abandoned mound shafts or in art fog holes. In KwaZulu-Natal, particularly in art fog holes and sinkholes. Um, in Pumalanga, they do sometimes uh, nest in, in mine shafts as well. They lay three eggs with two to three clutches per season, depending on um, how good that season is. Their current conservation status, globally, they are vulnerable with an estimated 1,170 pairs. Put this in perspective, each rhino there stands for a thousand rhinos that we estimate exist in the world. So compared to that, that's how many blue swallows exist in the world if each of those consists of around about a thousand blue swallows, which is probably an overestimate in itself. But in South Africa, they are critically endangered. So there are less than 250 individuals in the country, or we estimate between 35 and 50 pairs in South Africa, probably more closer to, to 40 pairs actually um, in the country right now. So Again, putting that in perspective compared to the, the rhino, which everybody is so rightly concerned about, we have about a half a blue swallow in, in the world, well, in South Africa anyway. So why are we in this predicament? Well, the primary reason for this is the loss of this bird's grassland, misspelled grassland habitat. And this has come from historically afforestation. A lot of grassland was, was planted up to, to timber plantations. This isn't the case anymore because most of the, the areas have been taken up with timber and, and, and new catchments are not being allowed to be opened. So we can't blame the timber industry for this anymore, but also um, agricultural development and then rural housing growth contributes a lot in terms of transforming this bird's habitat. And then mis the mismanagement of grassland, as you can see in the bottom left of the slide, where there's a very mismanaged piece on the left of that picture and a good piece of misspelled grassland on the right. What are we doing about this? Well, we're securing and supporting the management of Midlands misspelled grassland, um, i.e. blue swallow habitat through the Biodiversity Stewardship Program in KwaZulu-Natal. It's whereby we work with private and communal landowners to secure protected areas for the species and its habitat. And in the three years that we have been in partnership with BirdLife, we have managed to secure greater than 10% of the provincial target in KwaZulu-Natal for Midlands misbulk grassland. And we have quite a few um, protected areas which are still in the process of a declaration process. So we will be adding to that in the next, in the next year to year and a half as well. This is the area where 
these sites are in, in the Midlands of KwaZulu-Natal, where you can see the red circle. We've got Rilton Nature Reserve, which is SAPI owned at 120, Rilton Nature Reserve, which is 120 hectares, which is recently declared end of 2020. Um, we've got Tilly Tallam, which is just under 2,000 hectares up here in Pantley. We've got Tuwergi Nature Reserve at 682 hectares, which is near um, Richmond, between Richmond and Peter Maritzburg, near the Bainsfield area, for those of you who know it. Minerva Nature Reserve, which we're busy working on getting a, a, a verification and validation process done for them um, at 1,200 hectares, and they immediately border Tuwergi. So this together forms nearly 2,000 hectares of blue swallow habitat. Um, and then Roseland's Nature Reserve, which was declared in 2008, which currently is probably the blue swallow capital of the world. That has 45 nesting pairs and is, is a very productive area for these birds. So we need to look after it. And then we're working on another site called Niroda, which many of you might know as the Buddhist Retreat Center near Kaupo in, in southern KwaZulu Natal. And although it's a small area, it has nesting blue swallows and some of the, some very good condition misspell grassland and a very willing landowner who is wanting to conserve these birds in their habitat. And then down right in the south, which is possibly the, the southernmost distribution of blue swallow, we have Sunnyvale, and we're busy working with the landowners there to, to, to secure that area. And we know that there are at least two nesting pairs on that property. So we, what are the other conservation interventions that we are doing? Apart from working with landowners to secure habitat, we are intensively monitoring these birds in the province. We're monitoring the number of active nests. We monitor where they are and in private versus protected area. At the moment, we only have one state-run protected area that has blue swallows in it, and that is in Penpenta. So these birds are all on private and communal land, which emphasizes the need to work with private landowners. We monitor the number of eggs, the number of chicks, the number of fledglings that, that, that are produced. And then we also keep an eye on, on changes in habitat. And then very importantly, what we also do is before the birds get back in late September, early October, we go out to all the sites that we know of and we make sure that the nest holes that we know of are there are not blocked by vegetation and clogged up and we clean them out and make sure that they are usable by the birds when they get back. Moving forward, we will be expanding the monitoring and surveillance into Mpumalanga and the Popo provinces in South Africa in this next year, hopefully. We will be securing additional breeding sites through the stewardship program, as I've already alluded to and spoken about, and there's possibly a couple of extra properties that are coming on board too. Very importantly, management support for these existing sites. Um, landowners are not conservation managers. They are committed conservationists who, who, who want to do the right thing with their land, but they're not trained conservation managers. So the, the, the management support for these areas is critically important, and we are doing our best to provide that management support. Um, in terms of ensuring their compliance with the Act, providing management advice, updating management plans, and that, that all that kind of thing. We will continue to raise awareness and, 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 and extension to landowners about this bird and its importance and why we should look after it and its rarity, and then continuing the surveillance of nesting areas to ensure optimal conditions for nesting, moribund vegetation and stuff like that. And then lastly, but not least importantly, is answering the unknowns. We are embarking on on a process to try and answer a lot of the unknowns. We don't know what happens to these birds between here and where they overwinter in East Africa, um, and indeed what happens to them on their way back. Lastly, very importantly, to acknowledge our partners and supporters in this work. Our ph photograph edits from this presentation, fantastic photographs, particularly from Richard Flack and Roger Hogg, all our monitors throughout Quasi Natal who assist with our monitoring. You know who you are. Very great, thank, grateful thanks to you. And then um, we acknowledge our supporters and our partners, as I said, of this work. Without you, we could not do this. So thank you so much for your support. Good day. My name is Giselle Mirison. I'm Bird by South Africa's Estuaries Conservation Project Manager in the Western Cape. And I'm going to give a brief overview of the work that we do through this project to protect some of the province's most valuable but vulnerable estuaries. And for those of us who are passionate about seabirds, shorebirds, and other water birds, including birds in use of rarities, estuaries offer some of South Africa's top birding destinations, supporting a range of habitat types and birds and marine wildlife in extraordinary numbers. They are among some of South Africa's most productive habitats. They provide essential resources to the invertebrate and fishing industries, 
contributing to both local and national economies, as well as performing essential ecosystem services. Estuaries are focal points for tourism, development and recreation, as well as being home to communities with deep cultural ties to coastal resources. Unfortunately, they face significant pressure from a variety of sources and are among some of South Africa's most threatened, yet least protected habitats. In the past few decades, there's been a profusion of waterfront developments, reclamation, and increased human disturbance and overexploitation. In numerous cases, freshwater inflows and flow regimes, so vital to maintaining estuarine ecological health, have been reduced, altered, and polluted. So multiple interventions are needed to ensure their future health and productivity, specifically around their direct management and the protection of their freshwater input. There's also an urgent need to protect estuaries from outside threats like inappropriate mining, agricultural activities and development. So an estuary's protection status is of key importance as higher protection levels, like protected area status, provide security from such threats, as well as promoting better management and allocation of resources. Protected areas can include options like nature reserves and protected environments, and currently estuaries are vastly underprotected in South Africa. In the Western Cape, our estuarine important bird and biodiversity areas are the least protected in the province, and BirdLife South Africa has established a long-term program of work to improve their formal protection and management. And this includes working with private landowners to gain conservation recognition for their biodiversity rich lands through tools like biodiversity stewardship. And in the Western case, we began by focusing on the Berg River estuary on the West Coast and the Clay River estuary on the South Coast ranked third and fifth in the country for their conservation importance, respectively. And pictured here are areas of the Berg River Estuary floodplain, which are to be declared as part of the protected environment. And this will encompass threatened estuarine, strandfelt and plain horse habitat sites, including beautiful populations of several bird and plant species of conservation concern. 2021 also saw the launch of the Clay River Estuary South Bank project, which over the next three years will look to secure the estuarine, coastal forest, and fame boss habitats along the south bank of this very important estuary. Together with government departments and partner organizations, we have also identified 12 estuaries for the improved formal protection of state-owned estuarine land. But aside from our work on the increased formal protection of estuaries, the project also works towards their better management in other ways, through policy design and support, and by defending them from threats, for example, through the environmental impact assessment process. We are also involved in various education and environmental awareness raising initiatives. In fact, much of our work is geared towards producing tangible benefits for landowners and the local communities. In the estuarine catchments, the focus is often on water conservation, including carrying out alien clearing. And at the estuaries themselves, we are similarly engaged in habitat management, as well as supporting increased monitoring and research. An example of this includes our erosion control pilot project at the Berg River Estuary, which is trialing habitat rehabilitation and environmentally sound erosion control techniques aimed at restoring bankside habitats. In fact, much of our on-the-ground work is simultaneously geared towards local job creation and providing training. It is in this way, by engaging a broad range of stakeholders in this estuarine space and delivering these multiple socio-economic and nature positive benefits, that the project works to secure the long-term support for the better management and protection of the most important estuaries for conservation. I'd like to thank our many partners on the project. Without this work, it would not be possible. A special thanks to our major funders with WWF South Africa and the Root for Nature Foundation. Thank you.
The Protecting Species team aims to mitigate threats and provide focused conservation initiatives to safeguard our most threatened bird species, such as the endangered secretary bird. The Birds and Renewable Energy project has ensured that renewable energy developers have the relevant tools, research and guidelines available to make informed decisions at the planning stage of development to safeguard sites with high biodiversity value. Project manager Samantha Ralston Payton reviews these guidelines when new information comes to light. Good day, everyone. Welcome to the virtual African Bird Fair. Uh, for the last nine months, um, Bird Life South Africa has been tracking the movements of five whiteback vulture juveniles from Dronfield Nature Reserve. And the purpose of the project um, was to see if lead poisoning as chicks has any impact on these birds in their first year of life. Um, specifically, we wanted to track any behavioral changes that these chicks might be displaying. In other words, um, does it have any impact on the distance that they travel, on the flight height, and even on their survival rate? Um, does it make it, them more prone to certain types of mortalities like collisions with infrastructure and so forth? So in October 2020, um, a team of researchers went to Dronfield Nature Reserve and we selected five chicks for the study. Um, two of the chicks had very low lead levels, um, two of the chicks had very high lead levels, and one of the chicks had an intermediate um, lead level. And we fitted GPS transmitters to all of those chicks. And what is so wonderful about modern technology is that it allows us to create some very nice animations such as the one that you see there. And this is all based on the GPS um, data that we received from the transmitters. And what you can see there is that um, although the chicks are still moving around during the first two months, they are staying still fairly um, close to the nest and to mom and dad, I assume. Um, but what became clear um, in the first two months, and this was very interesting, is that although four of the chicks um, were moving around quite nicely and actively exploring their surroundings, there was one chick called Magellan um, that didn't move around a lot at all. And what was interesting about this is that Magellan had the highest lead level of all chicks that we examined. Um, but we will keep an eye on this. Um, you know, our sample size here was very small. So we will have to increase our sample size quite dramatically in order to make any definitive conclusions. What has been amazing to watch though is just the incredible distances that these juveniles travel, even though they are only 10 months old. Um, what you can see here is the movements of um, Josephine. Um, and you can see she, she hung around um, Drumfield for several months and then all of a sudden she decided, well, I'm just going to take to the road now. And she spread her wings and she, in two months, she flew through Botswana, around the Caprivi, into Angola, and down to Namibia, spent some time in the, um, the Itosha National Park before going to the Skeleton Coast. And as you can see from the animation here, she, um, it looks like she dipped her toes in the Atlantic Ocean before deciding, well, that was not for me. And she headed back to the interior. And Josephine is actually now back in Botswana, um, which is just incredible. So what's next? In October, we will go back to Dronfield Nature Reserve and we will fit trackers to an additional 15 chicks. And that will bring our sample size to 20. And that should really be um, good enough for us to make some fairly um, well-supported conclusions on what these birds get up to in their first year of life. So at this point, I would just um, like to thank my sponsors, um, specifically the Eastdale Family Foundation, and the Mary Oppenheimer and Daughters Foundation is actually now the Jail Foundation, as well as the Ford Wildlife Foundation, because without their support, um, this research would just not have been possible. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the bird fair. Hey everyone, my name is Christian Willem Brink and I am the Raptor and Lance Terrestrial Bird Project Manager for BirdLife South Africa. Today I'm just going to give you a quick overview of our Seven Man Snake Eagle Project, which is that beautiful bird on the left there. First off, this species is a forest specialist and you can find them in these coastal dune forests of a northern Kwazulu Atoll, but they also occur along the eastern coast of Africa. Now we're interested in bird because they are regionally critically endangered and there's only roughly 50 mature individuals left in South Africa. This is due to a range of threats, including infrastructure, the power infrastructure, which poses the risk of electrocution and wide scale habitat transformation, which is also occurring across Africa. 
Now, in order to effectively consider these birds, we need to know where they are, where their suitable habitat, we need to know how many of them are left, and we need to monitor these numbers, and we also need to identify threats and mitigate them. So first off, we did a species distribution model. Now this entailed taking a bunch of environmental variables, things such as climate, uh, as well as occurrence data from citizen science projects. And we feed this into the model and it gives us a heat map such as the one on the right there, which just indicates habitat uh, suitability for the species. And you can see the blue areas are more suitable habitat than the others. We also quantified habitat loss across the entire range of the species using some of our species distribution models. And what we found is that almost 20% of prime habitat has been lost over the last 20 years. And in order to understand how these birds are persisting in these transformed landscapes, we are conducting a tracking study and we've managed to tag the first two ever seven band snake eagles. And on the screen there, you can see the tracking data for both a male and female bird. And we are hoping to expand this study. We're also involved in the mitigation of power, the threats of power infrastructure, specifically with regards to transform boxes. You can see there on the left, there's some live jumper cables going up to the cross beams there. And uh, these structures have unfortunately to date uh, killed four seven-man snake eagles that we know of. And through collaboration with ESCOM, we have uh, orchestrated the insulation of 62 transform boxes in the core of the range of the species. Now we're also doing annual surveys. Now this is to ground truth our species distribution models, as well as to manage to help us calculate a robust national population estimate. And this is where we would like your help as well. So we're creating an event called the Zululand Snake Eagle Big Day, which will happen near the end of the year. And it will basically just entail getting as many people as possible out there looking for Southern Man Snake Eagles over the same weekend. So please join us, download the Bird Lasser app, which is an application for your phone in which you can log birds. Just make sure to sign up to the South Bird Life South Africa cause. And uh, yeah, come join us, contribute to conservation and uh, have some fun birding. Thanks. So as you've heard, the Landscape Conservation Programme is actively implementing our mission to support the protection of our most critical sites and threatened birds by encouraging appropriate management that supports healthy populations of birds effectively and sustainably. Over and above our conservation work, we actively engage with the public through events such as the Learn About Birds Conference and Flufftail Festival, via web-based presentations to bird clubs and regular presentations on the Conservation Conversations web webinar series, and written content in African BirdLife Ostrich and the BirdLife South Africa e-newsletter. We also lead birding excursions and share our passion for conservation through interactions with stakeholders across multiple sectors. In closing, thank you so much for listening to the Landscape Conservation Program's work and a big thank you to the many funders, partners and stakeholders who help us to give conservation wings every single day. Thank you. Welcome to the short introduction about the Science and Innovation Program at BirdLife South Africa. The Science and Innovation Program is a relatively new program with a very small staff component, however, we have an ambition, ambitious vision and mission. In short, it is to use innovative technologies to solve challenging research and conservation problems. There are many new technologies such as remote sensing tools using, for example, satellite data that can be used to do monitoring of species and their habitats. The other key word here is science. We aim that all our work will follow basic scientific principles as is a general aim of all the work that we do at BirdLife South Africa. The program supports various species projects. At BirdLife South Africa, for example, we support projects studying and conserving species like the white winged flaftail, blue swallow, secretary bird, rat's lark, bird's lark, sandbolt ibis, and black harrier. Through, for example, the use of habitat suitability models, climate change maps, and camera traps, we support the other Bayard Life of Africa program studying and conserving these species.
One of the most important projects in the program is the conservation modeling project. We produce cross-cutting species habitat suitability models, which aims to provide detailed bird distribution maps, which can be used for conservation planning purposes. It is impossible for me to explain what this project is all about in one minute. Please check our BirdLife of Africa YouTube channel for a webinar I presented about this project a few months ago. We also feed these habitat suitable models into the government supported national web based site screening tool, an exciting initiative from government, where environmental impact assessment specialists, developers, and the general public can indicate the footprint of a potential development on an online map. And the tool, the site screening tool, will then create a report to indicate if this development footprint contains any. Uh, threatened bird, plant, and animal species. We have already submitted models for over 40 species and hope to add more in the near future. We also hope that the habitat suitability models, these distribution maps, would be of value to conservation planning sector in South Africa. We have a well established conservation planning sector, and it's important for us to provide them with quality bird distribution data so that maps and other plans that they develop and produce will be accurate and of value. For example, we hope that our data will ensure that bird data are included in critical biodiversity area maps, a map that is used as the basis for, a, for, for almost all um, regional and local conservation plants and products in South Africa. The program also supports site conservation projects. We, for example, support the conservation work at Campus Dam. The most recent activity is to establish a local conservation group which will coordinate the research and um, conservation activities at this important bird and biodiversity area. We also support work at Rayfontaine, a property of Icarpa Minerals near Kimberley. We are developing a management plan for the property. And we have also installed camera traps to identify the mammals and birds that occur there. We also support the excellent work done by Sanbi to develop a new key biodiversity area network for South Africa. And you will hear a lot about this new and exciting initiative in the years to come. We also support the BirdLife South Africa List Committee, chaired by Dr. Chris Lotz. We each year produce a PDF in Afrikaans and English of the birds occurring in South Africa, as well as Microsoft Excel lists, which contain the complete list of the birds of South Africa, an Excel spreadsheet containing um, only the, the red data species in South Africa, and then there's also a near and endemic species list. These lists are updated on an annual basis, and you are more than welcome to follow the link to our website and download um, this list, it is of, uh, I believe it would be of great value. We support various citizens projects as, in, at Bird Lives of Africa, such as the Southern African Bird Atlas project and also Bird Lesson. But we not only support these projects, we also use the data extensively and attempt to produce maps and data that can be used for conservation planning purposes. We would like to use this opportunity to thank all the atlases who submit data and to the BIRTAS and team for all their hard work and dedication. The Regional Red Data Book for Birds is an important book as it helps us to prioritize our work by showing which species deserve, deserves our in, uh, dedicated intention. This document must be continuously updated as new information becomes available. The Science Innovation Team will soon begin work to update the Red Data Book, the last one which was published in 2015. We cannot do our work without the necessary funding. The Science Innovation Program would like to thank all our donors and funders for their support. This has been then a very short introduction about the work of the Science Innovation Program. In the coming years, we hope to produce some great new and innovative scientific products for the conservation of birds and their habitats. Thank you.
Today, I'll be sharing BirdLife South Africa's regional conservation program work within the region, aimed at collating biodiversity information to conserve key species and sites through developing partnerships and providing capacity development. The regional conservation program team consists of a program manager position, which is currently vacant, Bazeng Bazeng, who runs the Biodiversity Assessment for Spatial Prioritization in Africa, or BASPA project, Lindsay Smith, who's the program's assistant, and also aids the Policy and Advocacy Program, and I run the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, or EFI project. The African continent is one of the most biologically diverse continents in the world. However, its natural resources, including biodiversity, are being lost due to direct or indirect economic development pressures. Consequently, countries have not met their national, regional, and international biodiversity and sustainable development obligations and targets. Further exacerbating this, these African countries have not comprehensively assessed and mapped their biodiversity or identified important sites to ensure species and ecosystems global persistence. Therefore, these countries do not adequately consider where to invest in conservation or how to incorporate natural assets into development planning. BirdLife South Africa's regional conservation program provides technical capacity building and upskilling of African stakeholders to become country experts in global standards such as red listing, key biodiversity areas or KBAs, and other effective area-based conservation measures, OECMs, to strengthen regional partnerships and to collaborate on initiatives to meet the conservation challenge. Additionally, Countries are provided with support and strategic guidance and equipped with the relevant skills to improve the implementation and reporting requirements of international instruments. Ultimately, the program, in collaboration with its African partners, seeks to empower African countries, governments, conservationists, and communities to recognize the inherent, inherent value and irreplaceable significance of their incredible biodiversity and to take ownership of their sustainable development. The Biodiversity Assessment for Spatial Prioritization in Africa, or BASPA project, run by Bazeng Bazeng, aims to support and build capacity in African countries to mobilize a foundational biodiversity information on the status, trends, and pressures on national biodiversity. This is done by using the IUCN standards, such as the Red List of Threatened Species, which identifies species which are threatened, the Red List of Ecosystems, which identifies ecosystems at risk of collapse, and through the identification of key biodiversity areas, or KBAs, which are sites that contribute significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity. By using these tools, African countries can identify threatened and range-restricted species and propose strategies to conserve and protect them. They can use a network of KBAs to inform protected areas expansion strategies and to inform where large infrastructural development should happen on land and seascapes. It also allows countries to better report on their national and international biodiversity commitments. One such example where Bazeng was able to support Mozambique is through the capacity building support to establish a KBA, National Coordination Group, which is to, used to identify sites of global importance for biodiversity. 29 KBAs have confirmed, with many more requiring field surveys to confirm the presence of species at the site. These 29 KBAs have been presented to the general public and are being written up into various policy documents. Another example is at the Atewa Forest in Ghana, which is also an Alliance for Zero Extinction site, which is a site that harbors more than 95% of the global population of a species. Bazeng supported with a review of the site as a KBA. The site has been published on the World Database on KBAs, and the government of Ghana and many big corporates have used this information to save the Atewa forest from being mined. Moving on to the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative. The East Atlantic Flyway is the network of sites that are used by birds which travel thousands of kilometers and migrate from their northern breeding grounds in Eurasia to their wintering areas in Western and Southern Africa. These birds rely on a series of high quality coastal and inland sites that stop over points to feed and rest. The flyway is important for shorebirds, both for coastal and wader species, as well as numerous land birds. Approximately 90 million birds rely on this connected network of sites. Waders are particularly dependent on these key sites, many of which are well known and are shown in the map on the right hand side of your screen. Land birds also migrate along these pathways, but they migrate on broad fronts, utilizing multiple stopover and overwintering sites. 
This makes the conservation of land births much more difficult to manage when compared with waders. Migrants face several different threats on their journeys across rapidly changing landscapes. Examples of threats faced along the flyway are habitat loss and degradation, agricultural expansion and hunting and illegal killing. The East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, or EFI, was established in 2015 by a number of BirdLife partners, including BirdLife South Africa. The idea behind the EFI program is that the partners along the flyway lead the work to ensure the conservation of migratory species and their habitats along this flyway. In the Southern African region, the countries of focus within EFI are South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, as well as Angola. In some of these countries, there are BirdLife partners through which we collaborate, namely BirdWatch Zambia, BirdLife Botswana, and BirdLife Zimbabwe. In Namibia and Angola, where no BirdLife partner is established, we are working with other biodiversity NGOs and government departments. The project is partnering with and supporting countries to understand and report their biodiversity. Through training and capacity building, countries will improve their knowledge on the key threats these species face along the flyway improve the conservation and ultimately the management of these important sites, expand the network of areas which are protected and conserved, and influence policy to better ensure protection of migratory species nationally, regionally, and internationally. The EFI work broadly falls within three themes, species-specific work, area-based work, and policy and advocacy. An example of species-related work in the region is the Bird Population Monitoring Programme implemented by BirdLife Botswana and is extremely successful. It has been in existence for the last nine years and it monitors the trends of birds within the country. Some of the data coming out of this program includes the declines noted in vultures shown in the graph on the left and the steep declines in yellow-billed kites on the right-hand side. The program currently has 300 volunteers, rural communities and local guides, which are integrally involved in the project. The communities have begun to appreciate birds in their backyards they plant more trees to support them and put more water out to attract these birds. Engaging with international agreements, supporting countries to report against these agreements and opposing unsustainable developments at key sites for biodiversity are all key aspects of policy and advocacy work along the flyway. One example of support, for, support provided to the regional partners through the policy and advocacy manager and the EP project manager myself includes the support provided to Birdwatch Zambia and BirdLife Zimbabwe in developing a position paper on the proposed hydroelectric scheme in the Batoka Gorge. You can hear more about our regional advocacy and policy work from Melissa Lewis's presentation. In South Africa, BirdLife has played a key role in identifying key biodiversity areas. By protecting these areas, we will have the highest success in conserving priority biodiversity. South Africa is the first in the world to complete the national KBA assessment for all ecosystems and across multiple groups of species. Preliminary results conclude we have more than 540 KBAs in South Africa. These are just a few examples of the regional work being undertaken within BirdLife South Africa's regional conservation program. Ultimately, partnerships and collaborations are key to identifying and protecting these key sites and species within Southern Africa. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Andrew de Bloch. I'm the AV Tourism Project Manager at BirdLife South Africa, and I'm going to be talking you through the various sub-projects that I manage as part of my job at BirdLife. The AV Tourism Project forms part of the Empowering People program. Uh, this is a very new program at BirdLife South Africa. It came to be as part of a restructuring and strategizing uh, session in, in early 2020. Um, currently, the AV Tourism Project is the only project within the Empowering People program. However, this is going to change quite soon. The exciting news is that once this airs on the 31st of July, we should be interviewing applicants for the Empowering People program manager position. And this person will be responsible for the expansion of this program into all the exciting community and education work that we hope to be doing over the next year. The AV Tourism Project itself has quite a few different components. I'm gonna draw a few to your attention now. Um, there are various uh, projects that we run and a lot of uh, my work is also in heavy tourism support and development. So other projects that come up um, happen all the time. For example, consultancy work, um, assisting people with uh, marketing their establishments, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the two main projects, if I can say so, are the Community Bird Guide Project and the BirdLife South Africa recommended memberships. 
the Community Bird Guide project has been going on for nearly 20 years now in different guises. And essentially we train people from underprivileged and rural backgrounds to become professional bird guides, uh, giving them accredited training and the business and social and soft skills to become successful freelance bird guides. And we have around 50 of these guides that are active at the moment. You can find all their details on our website and please do go out and support them. It's been a rough year for them, of course, with the national lockdowns and restrictions of travel. Um, so please do go and look up their details. They've become some of the most highly regarded and loved characters in the birding community. Um, and uh, I'm going to give an update on that project very shortly. Then the BirdLife South Africa recommend, recommended memberships include recommended accommodations, recommended tour operators and recommended course providers. Essentially, these are members of BirdLife South Africa that we recommend to the birding public. They've been vetted through various criteria to make sure that they can serve birders and the needs that they have. Um, and I'm going to touch on each of these different classes in just a second. The last one I want to bring to your attention is the South Africa Listers Club. Uh, this is a fairly new club, only having been established in 2020. However, it's now about 400 strong. And the criteria for this club are that you have to have seen 300 or more species within the bounds of South Africa. Um, note that this is not a Southern Africa listing club. It's a South African and, and a proudly South African listing club at that. So please, we do encourage all of you who have seen more than 300 birds in South Africa to go and uh, add your totals to the list. Those of you who are in the club, remember to go and update your totals as well. This is all done on BirdLife South Africa's website. You can just go under the Go Birding tab where you can find all of the AV Tourism projects. Um, more information about anything I've talked about today, but also the South Africa Listers Club platform. So now a couple of updates on what's happened since I last presented uh, at the Virtual African Bird Fair in 2020. Probably the most exciting development uh, for the AV Tourism project in the last 12 months has been the initiation of another training course. We have eight guides being trained in the grasslands. They're currently being trained at the Buckerstrom Tourism and Education Center, which BirdLife South Africa manages. Um, and they're being trained by Wayne Johnson of African Edu Eco. And here you can see them all lined up in their COVID compliant formation. Um, this training uh, is going to be concluding in September this year. And hopefully we'll be graduating guides in the grassland areas, which currently don't have um, guides servicing them. So this stretches all the way from the uh, Golden Gate National Park in the west to Ladysmith in the east and includes Ngula Nature Reserve, which many of you will be familiar with. So very exciting to have eight new guides joining the fold. And uh, we look forward to what they'll be able to offer birders um, going forward. So please do keep your eyes out for more communications about how to get hold of them and make use of their services. Another important update on, on last year's activity is that the Bird of Friendly memberships have been restructured and rebranded to become the BirdLife South Africa recommended members. I'm going to go through each of the different classes at the moment, but basically this rebranding came about uh, in consultation with our members and what they hope to get out of this membership, as well as considering from BirdLife South Africa's perspective, how we wanted to manage this and uh, how we could work with our members um, to reach our conservation goals. So these, this uh, whole system has been updated. We now have tiered memberships across our three different membership classes. And essentially these are going to be the people that we recommend to birders. They get vetted against these criteria that um, make sure they can service birders and their rather eclectic needs at times. And uh, these will be the people that we recommend to birders who are traveling around South Africa. So the first uh, class of these uh, is the BirdLife South Africa recommended accommodations. This is a network of accommodations we have across the country generally in close proximity to special birding areas. And in fact, some of the accommodations themselves are considered birding hotspots. So they are committed to eco-friendly practices in their accommodations. Um, they are aware of the needs of birders, um, things like early breakfasts and early checkouts uh, may be an option. So please do visit our website and make sure that when you are planning your next birding trip, you do so in using our BirdLife South Africa recommended accommodations. Then talking about traveling for birding, we also have our BirdLife South Africa recommended tour operators. This is a, a network of professional bird guides and tour companies across South Africa who can service birders. 
of course, if you haven't been to an area before and you don't know the birds in the area, the best thing you can do is hire a guide. So either I would suggest using our community bird guides where there is one available. And we also have these tour operators who do really fantastic work guiding birders all over the country. A lot of them also do um, long, longer set departure tours either throughout South Africa or sometimes all over the world. So please do go and look up their details. Again, they've been vetted by BirdLife South Africa. Many of them are huge supporters of our conservation work as well. So please do make use of their services. And then lastly, this is our newest class. It just came in um, the 1st of July this year, are our BirdLife South Africa course providers. So BirdLife South Africa often gets requests from the public about where people can find course content, uh, where they can attend online and in-person courses. Of course, the latter has become quite rare during COVID times, but nonetheless, this has seen a, a spurt in online content and online courses being delivered. So we thought, well, we have our recommended accommodations, our recommended tour operators, why not include course providers as a third class of these? So we are currently uh, recruiting in some course providers. We have a few on our books already, um, but if you are, if you have attended a bird related course in the past, please do let them know that this opportunity is available. Of course, they also get the benefit of using the BirdLife South Africa recommended logo, as you can see there um, on their materials. And there's a range of other benefits that come with being a member of BirdLife South Africa, um, foremost of which is obviously supporting our conservation work. So uh, we are hoping to grow our course providers and be able to offer our birders out there a whole range of options um, for professional uh, course providers in the future. Lastly, I just want to bring to your attention an up, up and coming project. Hopefully it launches um, around the end of the year or early next year. But this will be called Go Birding South Africa. And essentially we are integrating all of our every tourism information. So that includes our birding routes, which were quite out of date. And then our accommodations, tour operators, our community bird guides, etc. into one integrated AV tourism platform. And so we came up with the name Go Birding and we put uh, a couple of names to um, all different birders. And this is what people seem to like the most. Essentially, it's going to be a web platform on the BirdLife South Africa web page as a subdomain. And there's going to be a map where you can basically navigate around the different sites, access all the information you need for trip planning. And we anticipate there's going to be a very popular platform for local birders as well as visiting birders who are coming to South Africa for the first time. And we'll also give great exposure to our uh, recommended members as well as our bird clubs um, and be a great resource for all birders. So I'm quite excited about getting this up and running. Um, we've already updated all of our birding route information and it's all being built in the background. So stay tuned for more information about this one. Then I just want to say thank you to those who support the AV Tourism Project. We have two uh, primary sponsors. Those are Nick and Jane Prentice, as well as Swarovski Optic and Wyler Distributors, who are the agent here in South Africa. They contribute uh, hugely to the success of the AV Tourism Project and its sustainability. Um, the Swarovski Optic team have been supporting uh, the AV Tourism Project and specifically our community bird guides for many years now. So thank you to them. And uh, also, I just want to bring your attention to our discussion that I'm having with Dale Forbes from Swarovski and Andrew Weissel from Wilder Distributors uh, at one o'clock on Feeder 2. So don't miss out. Um, you'll be able to ask Dale and Andrew all sorts of questions around binoculars and scopes and what you should consider when uh, buying a pair or, or looking at uh, getting the scope, for instance. So don't miss out on uh, that up and coming uh, slot in the program. Uh, we also just wanted to put it out there that we are looking for a third benefactor to this project. So if anyone is feeling particularly inspired by the work of the AV Tourism Project, uh, please let us know and we can uh, talk about this arrangement as well. Um, any and all support is always welcome. Thank you so much for listening to me. My details are on screen now. If you have any questions or if you'd like to get in touch, um, you can just email me on andrew.deblock at birdlife.org.za. Thank you so much for listening. Good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to be speaking to you today on behalf of BirdLife South Africa's policy and advocacy program. Now, this is one of our organization's smallest programs uh, with only one full-time and one part-time staff member, but we're nevertheless in a better position than many NGOs in other parts of Africa, which lack dedicated policy and advocacy expertise. 
And so because of that, one of the objectives of our program is to support the policy and advocacy work of other bird life partners in Africa. And we do this in close collaboration with BirdLife South Africa's East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, or EFI Project Manager, as well as the BirdLife Africa Partnership Secretariat and our partners in the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, which generously fund both the EFI project and the policy and advocacy program. Now, the support we provide takes the form, firstly, of capacity building by sharing experience and general guidance. And then secondly, we support our partners in their endeavor to combat significant threats to uh, specific priority sites. And it's this kind of support that I'll be discussing today. And when doing so, it's, it's of course important to bear in mind that work of this nature isn't to the exclusive benefits of other countries. Many of the sites concerned provide critical habitat for migratory species making their way to and from South Africa. And in addition to that, all of the development threats that I'll be highlighting today pose risks to sites that have also been declared uh, to be World Heritage Sites. Now bear in mind when we're talking about World Heritage Sites that in order to be listed as such a site, a property must have what's referred to as outstanding universal value, which means that its cultural and or natural significance is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and be of common importance to present and future generations of all of humanity. So we're talking about truly iconic sites of global importance. And unfortunately, what we're increasingly seeing is large infrastructure and extractive industry proposals in African countries being prepared and being approved with little or absolutely no consideration of potential negative impacts on the outstanding universal value of relevant world heritage sites. And this is, of course, deeply concerning. Now, my first example of this is the proposed Batoka Gorge hydroelectric scheme, which would be constructed on the Zambezi River downstream of Victoria Falls. And there are numerous concerns associated with this project. Some of them include that the development's reservoir would inundate part of the Victoria Falls Mosiotonia World Heritage Site, resulting in the permanent submergence of a rare and unique habitat. The Batoka Gorge is also a major breeding site for cliff nesting raptors, such as the Taita Falcon. And it's a concern that the project would constrain the breeding opportunities for these species. And then the project would also involve extensive transmission line infrastructure, some of which would run through vulture habitats. Now, the response to this by the BirdLife Partnership has been a collective effort. So with the assistance of BirdLife partners, including BirdLife South Africa, BirdWatch uh, Zambia and, and BirdLife Zimbabwe have reviewed the environmental and social impacts assessments for this project and have submitted various objections and comments in the form of a position paper. We also encouraged BirdLife International to write a letter expressing the partnership's concerns to the World Heritage Center, and this was done in March. And one of our concerns has been that despite being requested to do so, uh, the governments of Zimbabwe and Zambia have seemingly never presented the draft ESIAs to the World Heritage Center for review. And the drafts that we've seen don't comprehensively assess potential negative impacts on the site's outstanding universal value. And so we're very pleased to see that this month, a draft decision was presented to the most recent meeting of the World Heritage Committee, which recognizes these issues and highlights measures through which they should be addressed. Now, importantly, this isn't the only draft decision that we've been tracking at this month's World Heritage Committee meeting. We're also concerned about a proposed open cast copper mine that would be located entirely within the Lower Zambezi National Park. Now this proposal has a long and convoluted history. It was initially refused the requisite environmental approval because of concerns over the project's impacts on not only the National Park itself, but also the Mana Pools World Heritage Site across the border in Zimbabwe. Unfortunately, however, that refusal was subsequently reversed by the relevant minister in 2014. And also, unfortunately, the most recent legal challenge to this decision was dismissed essentially on procedural grounds earlier this year. And apparently the authorizations period of validity was, was recently extended so as, as to allow mining to commence. 
So we've been engaging closely with our partners in Zambia and Zimbabwe regarding this project and potential responses. Importantly, the World Heritage Committee has previously urged the Zambian government not to go ahead with the project. And we're really hoping that the committee will reiterate this call at its current meeting, and in doing so, add to the international and local pressure to abandon the project. And then last but not least, a matter which I'm sure you've all seen in the headlines is the oil and gas exploration by Recon Africa in the Kavango Basin in northern Namibia and Botswana. Now, although this, this project is only at the exploration stage, it is nevertheless occurring in environmentally sensitive areas, and it's potentially the first step towards extractive activities that would pose significant threats to world heritage sites in Botswana, including the Okavango Delta. And so BirdLife South Africa is engaging closely with various NGOs from both within and outside the BirdLife partnership um, regarding this matter. We submitted objections to the most recent EIA submitted in Namibia, which, which was essentially an application to conduct seismic surveys as part of the Namibian components of the project. In Botswana, exploration uh, has not yet commenced and the requisite EIA has not yet been conducted, but we will be tracking that process closely and we will be offering support to our partners in Botswana when the time comes for public consultation. And then in addition to that, BirdLife International has agreed to send letters to the governments of Namibia and Botswana, highlighting the partnership's concerns about this project. Uh, from a World Heritage Convention perspective, the EIAs prepared thus far have been reviewed by the World Heritage Center and the IUCN. They have identified various gaps and concerns with the documents, as have we. Um, and as a result, the draft decision before this month's World Heritage Committee expresses concern about these authorizations, and it calls for a more robust um, and peer-reviewed assessment process uh, moving forward. So just to sum up, um, although we do remain deeply concerned about the development threats I've highlighted today, we also welcome the fact that all three of them have been raised in the World Heritage Center and IUCN assessments that preceded this year's meeting of the World Heritage Committee. The meeting itself is actually scheduled to end on the same weekend as the Virtual African Bird Fair. So hopefully by the time this presentation airs, the relevant draft decisions will all have been adopted by the committee. We certainly call upon the relevant governments in Southern Africa to comply with these decisions and with their obligations under the convention. And as always, we greatly appreciate the support from our members and from our funders in our endeavor to continue to monitor and respond to these types of threats. And we'll, con we'll continue to keep you updated on our activities and on our progress through both BirdLife South Africa social media and through the BirdLife South Africa newsletters. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Virtual African Bird Fair. Thank you to my BirdLife South Africa colleagues for sharing their important and exciting conservation work. Did you know one of the easiest ways to support BirdLife South Africa is to sign up as an annual member for our organization? Your membership fees go a long way to helping us give conservation wings. You can contact membership at birdlife.org.za or visit our website to find out more. Up next, CEO Mark Anderson will be interviewing Sandy Swakula, who has become somewhat of a virtual celebrity on BirdLife South Africa's Facebook group during the past year in lockdown. Stay tuned on Feeder 2 to catch this exciting interview at 10.30.